Hey everybody, how's it going? I'm Chase. Welcome to another episode of the Chase Jarvis Live Show here on Creative Live. You know the show, this is where I sit down with amazing humans and I do everything I can to extract all that valuable insights out of their brain and help you live your dreams in career, in hobby, and in life. My guest today, you will know him well. He is the founder of FUBU, that clothing brand. He's also very well known as ABC's Shark Tank Shark, Mr. Damon John, and we're here today to talk about his new book, Rise and Grind. Damon. Thanks for having me. Again, thank Again. you. Again, so veteran of the show. Yeah, man. You, you know, you, you have some good questions. I love it. Thank you very much. Yeah. I liked our last interview a lot. It was very, very popular. And that was a little bit about the power of broke. Yep. Uh, but new book. New book. Congratulations. My new book, uh, Rise and Grind. It's going to be out um, uh, January 23rd, okay. I believe. Is that 23rd? January 23rd. Um, You're just bringing the heat. The the new year, I'm, it's just... I'm going, I'm going hard, baby. Um and pretty much, you know, um, the, here's, here's the concept of the book. You know, as we had talked about the power broke and the fact that I wanted to get people to realize, stop using the fact that you don't have money as an excuse. I understand everybody else in the world tells you you need money to make money and all that other kind of stuff. Yep. And I want to give people the mentality of, all right, listen, I need to do this myself and I need, I need to use my Slack resources or the resources that are right in front of me yep. to get where I want to go. So now... After a, a lot of people have responded to that book really well, and I, at first I thought they were going to hear "Power Broke." I don't want to. I don't want to be reminded of <laughs> me being broke, or I don't want to hear when yeah. Dame was broke. They responded to really, you know, to in a really amazing way. They started to ask, "Well, what are the techniques?" You know, I need now. Now I have the mentality. What are the techniques uh, that you do every single day, and why are you more successful than this person or this person more successful than this person? We all have the same 24 hours in a day. Mm -hmm. So that's when I created uh, this new one, Rise and Grind. And the theory is that, listen, every day we're gonna rise. If we're not gonna rise, we're dead, right? <laughs> that's your defense, you're just rising, right? <laughs> yeah, sure. But your grind is your offense. And I've studied, I believe, uh, I I've studied dozens of subjects, but I put about 16 subjects in this new book and they range from everywhere from, uh, award-winning actress uh, Catherine Zeta-Jones to Santana, Carlos Santana, to our, our crazy friend Gary V, <laughs> to uh, um, you know a, a young man named Kyle Maynard who um, was born with no arms and no legs and uh, army, army crawled on uh, Mount Kilimanjaro. I'm, I'm sure you know yeah, him yeah. as well. Uh -huh. um, to <clears throat> various other people, uh, Brian Lee, who started Shoe Dazzle uh, and- uh, oh, With Kardashians, uh, right? With yeah. Kardashians, mm -hmm. uh, Legal Zoom, and then all of a sudden he does uh, honest company with Jessica Alba. I love that uh, story. He wanted to be a rapper. He wanted to be a rapper. Uh, <laughs> I think he, I, he, he's tonight. a young. He was he was a young Asian man who told his parents he's moving to New York to be a rapper. <laughs> I'm not even going to tell you his rapping name. Um, I'll, I'll let you read the book. Um, what did, uh, you know? I asked them all the same questions and then some different ones. What do you do the first 90 minutes of your day? What do you do the last 90 minutes of your day? What did you do when you were 20 that you no longer do when you're 40? What did you do when you were 20? that you forgot to do, and then when you start doing it again, when you were 40 or 50, you, you realize like, what got you back to this point. Yeah. Um, and I, I, would, I, I found probably over 50 things in there that everybody did in some way or another very similar. Whether in the morning, Joel Olstein, whether it's in the morning they either prayed, meditated, mentally like me, set a goal uh, and zoned out they took some time for themselves, yeah. and I found various other things, and, and, and it's amazing and fascinating. So this is what I, I wanted to create for people, because I wanted them to either say, I'm on the right track, I'm doing something, everybody was laughing at me when I do this, or maybe I should try this one, because or this one doesn't work as well as this one. Yeah. And I've been using it myself, a lot of the stuff, uh, and it's been working for me too. It's been helping improve my life, and, and that's I'm a student of my books, because I'm trying to ask them, the same exact thing that other people want to know. Yeah. So let's, uh, uh, the tactical stuff I love because there's so many things. It's the people who are watching this show. They're creators and entrepreneurs. They want to get their hustle and their grind on. And I think a lot of tactics. Before we get to the tactics, I want to, I want to set the stage. Sure. Um, and there's a little bit of overlap between this and our last interview. If you haven't listened, you should. Uh, you folks at home who are paying attention right now. Um, but conceptually, take me back to your first entrepreneurial moment. I think I, I remember. I remember you selling hats or something like this. Yeah, well, like, like how did it start for you? 
Um, I, I've had so many, and, and, and even though you're saying the first, but they were first in different levels, it was just hustling. Sure. Then it was just, all right, I have an idea and I'm really going to try to make it happen. Then it was, all right, I'm actually going to, this idea was cool, but now I need to create a structure of business in whatever the case is. Yeah. So I've had, I've had many entrepreneurial experiences, but I, I would say that my first uh, official, uh, I'm in business having to pay taxes entrepreneurial experience, yeah. I was before the hats. I was actually a, a, a van driver in Queens, uh, in what we call uh, gypsy vans. And this is a van that a uh, 15 passenger van. I would drive down the bus routes and pick up people for a dollar instead of the bus picking them up. And they would pay cash and hop off. And and I would get up every morning, five o'clock in the morning, and I would go to bed 10, 11 o'clock at night. And that was my first business. And I actually, you know, I enjoyed it at first because it was fun. I was doing my own business, like all of us entrepreneurs. We were like, I was like. My success or my failure depends on the choices that I made, and I was really excited about it, but I got burned out. And I realized, uh, you know, if you look at a Tim Ferriss 40 hour work week or something that, of that nature, I, I realized that I was working 60 hours and making less than I was making when I worked as a waiter in Red Lobster. I was netting less, and my yeah. health was declining, and I was miserable. Um, and, uh, and then I went on to a couple other businesses, which was obviously I, I started selling hats uh, yeah. out of a passion and a, a love for a market that I felt was being ignored. And all of a sudden, bang, it became FUBU in a blink of an eye, which took nine years, but it's still <laughs> yeah. a blink of an eye. Ten-year overnight success, yeah. right? So was there also was a, as an auto body thing? I remember you were buying and yeah. selling cars so, and building them. <laughs> Sorry. So, so that was my side investment, yeah. right? That was the, all right, my day job is not going to make me rich. It'll be my homework theory. Yeah. I was driving the van. Uh, I had to save up as much money as I could. So probably about a year in after I paid for tickets, maintenance, and all that other crap, you know, uh, Department of Transportation violations and all that <laughs> kind of stuff, I, um, I, I had... I had this idea that I was going to, you know, um, buy and sell crash cars, right? So I'll buy it at five thousand, put twenty five hundred into it, and then sell it at ten thousand. It's simple. And if you put the math together, I was going to do that every month, and then they would start compounding in two, three years. I was going to be a gazillionaire. Yeah. Pretty much simple. I had it all planned out. That go and it? I love I love joking, <laughs> saying Mike Tyson's you know theory is uh, you know everybody has a plan until they get punched in the face, and life will punch you in the face. I pretty much got punched in the face probably six months into it, um, and then I found myself working at Red Lobster with none of that money because I was trying to do it for money. Yeah, you know, um, I hate I really hate working on cars because I can't work on them. <laughs> My hands are really buttery sore. My hands feel like veal. I'm not supposed to work on a car, man. And I'm thinking, uh, you know. At least I you can, know that about yourself, though. I like, love that. Uh, you know, well, I, I knew it myself after the first transmission, yeah. you know, crushed my foot. And then I was real like, like you know what? I think, I think hats are better. You know, so, but again, you know, I, a lot of people out there chasing their dream, but their dream is uh, to just be rich. Yeah. And that's not a dream, you know. Uh, if you if you if you if you try to go out and make just make money for the purpose of making money, first of all, you could end up in the wrong place due to it. You could yeah. be miserable, and then when you get it, if you don't have no goal on why you were trying to achieve this goal, you feel unfulfilled. Yeah. So there's so much embedded in there, and again, this is like a perfect overlap from our last conversation to this one, which is, for example, working just for money. Yeah. So inevitably. This is a, like of the hundred or so people we've had in the show. This is a pattern. You talked about the pattern for your book. Yeah. There's patterns, right? This, this, this is a pattern in the and books. Yeah. Inevitably, shit gets hard. Yeah. And when shit gets hard, and it does in yeah. every business, mm -hmm. um, every business, it's how much do you care about what you're working on? Yeah. That's going to help you get through. And if you're just chasing dollars, yeah. You know, and and this is a. There's so many folks out at home who are. I feel like trying to figure out what their thing is. And what I loved also about what you just said is that, I mean, you just named like three or four things. You waited tables, you did crash cars, you sold hats, you had, yeah. you know, your, your uh, gypsy van pickup. Mm -hmm. How did you get from there to what you really want to do? What was, the, what was the internal conversation that was like, well, transmission sucks. I don't want to go after money. I want to do something that I love. And so was love around the fashion part of it or how did you get there? Yeah, so it was out of fear. It was out of uh, it was out of fear. It was out of not trying to live up to everybody else's expectations, um, and then it happened. You know, so 
I went through those periods of time as a young kid just trying to hustle to make money, but at the time where I grew up, in the area I grew up was Hollis, Queens. And in Hollis, Queens, 1986, ripped Hollis, Queens apart in two different directions. One direction uh, was, it was known as one of the areas where the first assassination of, a, of somebody who was being guarded for a court case was uh, killed by crack dealers because crack came in and, and ripped the neighborhood apart. And a lot of my friends ended up becoming drug dealers and dying. President Reagan was talking about Hollis Queens at the same time. At the same exact time, simultaneously, Run DMC, Salt and Pepper, LL Cool J, Ja Rule, uh, Tri a Tribe Called Quest, 50 Cents, and everybody was from this area, right? Yeah. From this one little That's three mile crazy. area. Yeah. So I decided I wanted that part of the world. LL Cool J and stuff like that. Um, my friends started dying and going to jail, and I started realizing, and, and these are friends that I w were in first grade with. It's not like I, I came outside and said, hi, can I look to hang out with a drug dealer, right? These, yeah. are, these are kids you go through life with. And I started to fear a couple of things. I started to fear that, number one, if I look at the stats, by the time my friends go in and out of jail in 10 years, I made more money working at McDonald's if I, if I could, and I didn't have to go to jail two and three years. I'm really cute. I didn't want to go to jail, man. <laughs> it, wouldn't have been, it wouldn't have been beneficial for me. It wouldn't have been good. Um, good for somebody, but yeah, not I'm you. Not a and I'm a, I was a scrawny little kid. I mean, I was 5'3". You know, I, you know, I didn't want to go to jail. Also, um, I, they had to look over their back all the time, and, and, and the only thing worse than jail is they were dead. So I didn't want to do that. Um, so I stayed away from that and I tried to do all these little businesses. Now, when I finally realized this passion I wanted to do called FUBU, mm -hmm. it wasn't because I was like, oh, uh, uh, you know, I'm going to be rich. It was that uh, at that time, hip hop to me was, the mo and it still is, is a yeah. very valuable form of communication. And that was our version of Twitter and Instagram. We were communicating through the music now, right? Yeah. The kids were talking about all these aspects. And then I started hearing rumors that these companies didn't like these kids. And I was going, Who's ever going to show people that they love them and make this? So I started making it for passion, for mm -hmm. free. Number one, I was making it because I wanted to push this culture forward. Number two, I wanted to show on, uh, other, other uh, people that I valued them. Uh, number three is it gave me a reason to go onto the video sets to talk to all the video girls and <laughs> eat the free food. I get to go on a set and see LL Cool J because they're like, hey, you got to get out of here. No, no, no. I'm supplying the shirts and hats. <laughs> Oh, here's your chair, sir. Yeah, yeah. I didn't, I didn't care if they bought a shirt or hat or yeah. not. I was up there watching him do Rock the Bells. I was yeah. happy. Yeah. And, and then I, was, I had a reason to talk to people at clubs and yeah. go out to the Javits Center at a flea market and talk. To, it gave me purpose. Yeah. And, and I would have done it for free forever. Right? You know, everybody else is paying to go to a video set or paying to go to a club. I'm getting in for free. Yeah. And I'm leaving a bunch of girls' phone numbers. Yeah. Right? And cool dudes who I can hang out with. Before I know it, man, I mean, it just kept growing and growing and growing and growing because yeah. I, I have no problem working for uh, 18 hours in one day on it. I had no problem. I loved it. Because you loved it. Because I loved it. So there's something about contributing to culture that makes you feel like you're a part of a movement, something bigger than yourself, that I feel is also a really common thread from people who've been on the show. And I think it's cool that you ranked it because, you know, one, let's talk about the fear. You know, you said fear and being a part of something and supporting your yeah. friends and... And then all those other, like money or fame or connection was number three, four, five. Yeah. But let's go to fear, because I think, I, th I found it interesting that not a lot of people find their passion out of fear, but I think it's very real. And since not a lot of people talk about it, what's your take? Talk yeah. to me a little bit more about the fear. fear yeah, people. so I, I think we all fear, there's a couple things we all probably fear. Being judged unfairly, um, not being able to provide for our loved ones and our family, death and losing people that we, we, we love. Um, I think those are a lot of things. But the fear ourselves are often about the fear of being able to be acknowledged and or the fear of failing and people looking at you as a failure. Yeah. Because you, you, you... It's a human need, right? It's a human like, need, right? Babies you want to that be don't accepted. get loved, babies that don't get loved literally die. Yeah. So like yeah. Conne human connection is You want to be accepted and you have to always second guess yourself. I second guess myself every day, right? And, and it's the fear of saying, there, there's no point in my life that I didn't have fear and I call it a healthy paranoia in business. Mm -hmm. Who was doing well? Okay, well, the hot clothing line lasts five years. Damon, did you get bit by the apple? You know, did you bite the apple once or get hit by lightning? No, I got to do it again. All right, all right, you got to do. All right, you failed in the next three launches. What are you gonna do? No, I got to do it again. Oh, I got to share this idea of who I am with the world. I want to empower other entrepreneurs, but I'm dyslexic. I'm gonna write a book. 
are you kidding me? People are going to laugh at me, right? Um, you know, you're going to go on to be on a TV show. Are you, what are you talking, I'm not articulate. I didn't, I didn't, um, I didn't go to college. Uh, you know, you have people like Mark Cuban, he's a billionaire sitting yeah. next to me. You know, I'm a couple of hundred million short. I mean, you know. <laughs> How am I going to debate against him? All right, I got I to gotta have a mental judo game. I got to create a chessboard against him. I can't lose this deal. All right, all right. Mark Cuban's going to give you a billion dollars, but you know, just like when you have a house, you only sleep in one bedroom, right? Mark has a mansion. I'm sleeping in one bedroom, and I'm here for you. You're the bedroom, right, man? Mark's yeah. running all around. Screw him, and then I, bang, I get him, and I, <laughs> and I get him out of the deal. You know, fear of, uh, you know, am I... Uh, am, I, am I leaving my daughter's uh, inheritance or a legacy? How will, the, how will they perceive me? You know, yeah. fear of making my daughter's public people where now they have pressure on them and I don't want to, I want to hide them from everybody or, or in fear of anything else. You know, yeah. the president of the United States, President Obama, made me a, a president, presidential ambassador for global entrepreneurship. I can never let him down, right? Yeah. It, it, it's always going to be some level of fear and that fear is good if yeah. it's healthy. Yeah, it's you so know? crazy. There's all kinds of good science coming out now talking about, we've talked about how bad stress is for you. Yeah. Stress is an amazing motivator. It is a motivator. It gives you superhuman strength. It gives you fortitude. It gives you power. Sure. And uh, I think it's, well, it's admirable that you're willing to talk about that publicly. Um, you said a couple things in there that I also want to touch on, and, and that is your dyslexia. Yeah. Uh, so Richard Branson was on the show not too long ago. Um, his... You know, for him, he also wrote a book and was really concerned about the view of what that meant, being dyslexic, writing a book. Am I doing something that's, you know, uh, do I identify with this community? The fact that it's called dyslexia, it's mm -hmm. like a negative orientation. Sure. But tell me, A, you know, so many folks at home, we've all got our shit, right? We've all got our baggage. Yeah. How did you overcome that? And are you an entrepreneur in part because of that? And give me a little bit of insight there. So I didn't know I was dyslexic until probably about, I think, 15 years ago, and I overcame it because my mother gave me so much love and passion, and and she told me that, uh, I, she, she showed me where I excelled at, and she made my made me bust my ass and where that I was weak at. Yeah, so doubling down on your strengths, essentially. Doubling right? down on my strengths. Um, and also, it is, because, you know, is one of the reasons I'm an entrepreneur, because number one, I look at a book, um, and I know I'm not grasping everything, so I have to read it three times when somebody has to read it one time. Number two is that even if I look at it and read it, I don't know if I absorb the information in a proper way. So if there is a way I can do what it's saying in the book, I go out and physically do it. I take action on it because then I say, okay, I got it correct. Um, when I was in high school, I, I, I um, you know, of course, I didn't want to go to history and I didn't want to go to English class. Um, so how did I, what was my cheat? How did I get out of it? Yeah. I went to a co-op program where I would get credit for going to work someplace one week and then come back to school the next. So now I cut my work in half, wow. right? Uh, my school work yeah. in half. Going there, I ended up working uh, as a foot messenger for a company called First Boston. It was happened to be a, a venture firm. Um, I would learn things in there, like I would go upstairs and the messengers were, the messengers were considered like, you ever seen when the caddies went to Caddy Shack and they get the day at the pool? <laughs> Right, <laughs> that's what we were when we go to the corporate, uh, you know, uh, 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 cafeteria. So we'd all come in there, you know, headphones on, you know, whatever the case is, right? Rapping and break dancing, and, and the. <laughs> but I would see people up there who were complaining about they couldn't get another house in the Hamptons and they're on their sixth, uh, sixth marriage or something yeah. like that and they were miserable. And I'd work down in the messenger center with people who were. You know, they may have been sending money home to Dominican Republic. They were going home every night to their family, and they had a better quality of life than the than the rich assholes that I saw upstairs. Uh, so I started to realize the a saying my mother used to always say that uh, money is a great uh, slave but a horrible master. And I started to also it started to to, to build me as a person. Um, and then I, I realized I was dyslexic later on in life, and I um, I was very harsh on my daughter who got expelled on purpose because the the the, the um, school works very hard, and she yeah. and I didn't notice that she was dyslexic. Yeah. Wow. And now I, I love sharing it. Like like Richard Branson, there's 12 sharks. If you look at the guest sharks, and eight of us are dyslexic. Um, uh, you know. Oh, say that again. Twelve. Out of the 12, eight of twelve. Eight of eight sharks. of the eight of the 12 sharks are dyslexic. Um, wow. And uh, you know, and I go out and share this wor world of dyslexia because 20% of the world is dyslexic. It's 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 not a sickness. We just absorb information in another way, 
Um, and uh, there were many presidents who were dyslexic. Einstein was yeah. dyslexic, you know. Uh, there, there are a lot of people who are dyslexic. And the reason why I share this is not to brag about myself being dyslexic, but two of the things that are invisible challenges that kids have in school are hard of hearing and dyslexia. And when they have those invisible challenges, a kid, as we, you've seen what's been going on in the, um, the internet, a kid doesn't wanna go, huh? Because yeah. they didn't hear something right. Because what happens? They get bullied. Yep. You're an idiot, you're a dummy, you know, whatever the case is. So they shun away and they can be brilliant kids. And but but what happens is if they don't have a support system like a loving mother around me or a great teacher who's our our number one mentor is externally from our family who says you're better than that, they go out in the communities and then the drug dealers, the pimps and all the whores and all that stuff, they don't care if you can read, write, or thing. They go, No, you you're smart. Yeah. And then they lure you if they if you don't have the right things around you. There's a lot of brilliant people who are incarcerated and or they found another route because they wanted to be accepted and somebody else accepted them because they wanted a, the the fear of being uh, made fun of was over here. And I share this with people so that they they look into this thing when they're when they feel their child is having some level of challenges in school. What'd you do when you figured out your daughter? Well, first of all, how did you figure it out? And then what'd you do? Uh, we had we. My, uh, my wife uh, uh, had my daughter tested, but my wife, honestly, I was, I was uh, my, this was my first marriage, I was running the globe, I didn't have time for schoolwork, and let me tell you something, she went to a school that was a very advanced school, I didn't know what the hell she was doing. I didn't know yeah. what her homework was. When I was, I, yeah. I, that was that was like fifth grade homework. I was like, "Holy crap! I don't know this." Yeah. You know what I mean? So I was yeah. embarrassed to even look at it. Yeah. Um. And my wife at the time was like, she's writing her words backwards and things of that nature because there's various different forms of dyslexia. Yeah, of dyslexia. Excuse me. Even that's being dyslexic right there. Yeah. Now, um, that's like an unfair word. Like, yeah. There's even the word. The look at the word. It's like, it, it's anyway. Sorry. Yeah. No, it, it is an unfair word. Uh. But, you know. Anyway, so you figured out that she figured was out, got her help, uh, got her a way to harness the power of what she does, and uh, she's uh, she's brilliant now in what she does. So, well, you got uh, embedded in that story also. I'm keep sort of meta referring yeah. back to what you just said, but the traditional education, so creative life exists in part to transcend this tr this traditional system that we've got that's sure. basically it's advanced babysitting in one one regard like you put and also you put people in and you move them through this system all at the same time despite people having all kinds of different learning abilities sure. and socioeconomic status and background and and um, ability and then we what, we what does it create it creates a bunch of widgets people who are you know tries to make us the same but yeah the real yeah but the yeah. reality is that it's not what life is about so in part creative life exists to be different than that it sounds like you schooling did not go well for you is that fair to say yeah no I got left back in yeah. seventh grade um, I was okay as a student. I mean, honestly, I was pretty good because I really never did homework, never did anything else. I just went in the in the in the I went in class and pretty much aced it. I, I got generally Bs, and I didn't put any effort in because yeah. I, it, it was just easy to me. Math and yeah. science was all the easy to me. Um, but I but I did have my challenges when it came down to um, reading and history. Reading and yeah. history. Yeah, got it. So, how do you think that that world that you grew up in? You're not all that old, you're quite young, but how does that world differ from the world that you see today with respect to education and opportunity? Well, I think that there's a lot more information that is at our fingertips, good and bad, that we can access. I think that the tools are there uh, that we can get uh, easier and quicker data from as we, we go into um, and do tests and, 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 and try to figure out who we are. Mm -hmm. You know, back then I had to just go to the library and look through a crap loads of encyclopedias and it wasn't interactive at all, yeah. right? Um, <clears throat> the worst card catalog, you remember the card catalog? Yeah, yeah, exactly, it, it wasn't. Now, even like, uh, you know, and I'll just do a selfish plug, we didn't plan on it, but I, I do have a program called Damon On Demand that's interactive, I just thought about that since you okay, brought it up. Of course. Eight hours of entrepreneurship, uh, or eight hours of my biggest mistakes and eight hours of solutions to run your business. But a, a, a typical example like that was, was not really at hand. And then also, you know, if you don't, if you didn't have an education, how how are how are the teachers getting educated on this funnel system and how to separate things uh, and things like that? So I think today it's way it's way easier, but as easy as it gets, the the application and the efforts have to be put in yeah. no matter what. Well, they, and the distractions are way more 
uh, you know, prevalent today as well. For sure. So, so I think this is a reasonable segue to the book because to me, you know, again, citing Creative Live here just for a second, talk about plugging, but that, yeah. that's why Creative Live seeks to connect people with the world's top experts to help them learn. And in a sense, that's exactly what your book is, right? Yeah. You, you, sounds like you learned from the people that were around you, whether that was in business or on the street or your messenger gig or yeah. whatever. Mm -hmm. And in a sense, is that still your preferred learning method and that's what you've done with, with the book? Tell me, I mean, tell me, do, did you go to those people because they had insights that you didn't have or because you learned from them or what, what's the purpose of assembling all these great minds? I, for, I, went, I went through every one of these. Rise and grind. Yeah, and I'm sorry to cut you off. No, I, went, no. I went through these, these people because they were established in so many different areas of life. Um, and I, I believe that just like when I first read Napoleon Hill, Think and Grow Rich, it says you'll see a word in there over a hundred times. You may not get it the first time. You may not get it the thirtieth. You may get it a hundredth time. Um, and you should you should you should read the book if you, obviously if the if you're the four people on the planet that haven't read it. Um, I figured that if I studied these subjects of who all are massively successful in so many different areas in life, that you were going to start to get it. You're going to see the rhythm. When you see somebody like Santana, who was probably one of the top 10 guitarists in, the war, in, in history or in the world, um, when you realize that he doesn't even practice the guitar anymore, he doesn't get up and rise and grind on the guitar. He gets up and rise and grind on uh, his health, uh, his spirituality, and he says it flows through the guitar, right? Um, now, I understand he's a little hippie-ish, but he, you're going to learn a lot of things from him. Sure. There's a million pretty faces in the world. What made a, a, a girl from a small area in, um, you know, in a Welsh girl from a small little town whose father was owned a, a, a candy manufacturing little factory and her mother was a seamstress, what made a Catherine Zeta-Jones leave home at a young age and become one of the most globally recognized faces on the planet? Uh, everybody's a pretty face, right? Yeah. But also, let's look at the other side. Who, who, like a Cal Mayner, who, uh, who uh, as I shared with you, had no arms, no limbs, how did he, you know, start wrestling at a certain age and in school and lost every match, lost 30 or 40 matches, whatever it is, year one, goes back, year two, starts beating people, and guess what they started to say about him? Hmm. You have an unfair advantage. The man has no arms and no legs. I was like, what, Kyle, how can you have an unfair advantage? He said, well... If I'm wrestling at 120, and somebody else is 120, and my 120 is all torso, they said I had an unfair advantage. Wow. He was like, trust me, they don't want the advantage that I have. <laughs> you know yeah, what I mean? this is an advantage? Yeah, this is an yeah. advantage. So I think there are a lot of things you'll see in there that no matter who you are, where you go, and where you, you'll always have people who say, ah, oh, you know, y you were lucky. No, you weren't lucky. Um, and, and this is what I wanted to show people, that people have this theory that the other people who are doing okay in life are all walking on clouds and walking on water. Right. It's not, we all have our own, our yeah. own problems, right? Yeah. Yep. I share in the book that, um, you know, when you and I were talking here, you had some really, you have like, you have like um, the 2.0 version of a uh, peanut brill mm -hmm. around That's here. That's right. right? It was the like with honey Cashew clusters. Yeah, those things, right? <laughs> I was eating them, I was thinking they were really delicious. I know that you're, you know, into health and stuff like that. But I even share in the book how uh, I went and I, even though I, uh, I was doing really good in life, I went and got something called an executive physical. And it was like, you know, somebody said, with all the money you have, why don't you go to an executive physical? I said, what the hell is an executive physical? They were like, well, it costs about seven or $10,000. It's not covered by insurance, but they check everything on your body. I said, whatever, I'll go get it because you know what? Everybody claims they don't have money for this, but Louis Vuitton and the, and the Mercedes dealerships are filled with people in there buying a whole bunch of crap, right? Let me go get it. They find a nodule on my thyroid. I go and get it checked out. I go and get a surgery to remove half the nodule on my thyroid. It's stage two cancer. I didn't realize I had it, right? Wow. Um, and the reason why I bring that up is that part of the rise and grind is our health, right? So true. Entrepreneurs don't take care of themselves. They take care of everybody else. I don't have time for it. I don't have money for it. I need to buy a new cash register. I need to buy more inventory. I'll get to it tomorrow. And you know what happens? They don't get to it. And what happens after that? 
they're not like a person like me they, who, who will sit there and be proactive to find out how I can address my health. They'll put their head in the sand and say, oh my God, every time I see somebody sick, uh, I don't want this to happen to me. And, and, and somehow they'll, they'll avoid it and all of a sudden what will happen, right? So that's part of the rise and grind too. I, yeah. I, I, and I found that in various different people. Their yeah. health was part of it as well. So yeah. it's I know I'm rambling, but no, I'm just no, learning, through, I'm learning all this stuff at the same time. It's through an epiphany for most of those people, right? Yeah. Like, uh, we talked about our buddy Gary V. Gary V. came on this show in 2012 or something, and he calls himself that. That was when he realized that was Fat Gary. Yeah. And what Fat Gary? I mean, what what he you know then thought about it for a second. He was not eating, was not sleeping, was not exercising. Yeah. And had that same realization that you were talking Does about. Does he exercise? Yeah. Now? He, yeah. He's got a personal trainer that goes everywhere with him. Guys, guys, getting after it. He's lost. Probably like thirty pounds yeah. since then. Yeah, Gary is um, Gary is fascinating because I don't know how he exercises. Because here's my point: I was talking to him, and he says that he walks around a lot of times because uh, with his shoe untied, and everybody stops him. He says, "You know, your shoe's untied." And I said, "Well, Gary, why don't you why don't you tie your shoe?" He said, "I don't have time to tie my shoe." I said, "But what about when you're taking a crap? Why don't you just tie your shoe when you're taking a crap, right?" And he goes, "I take a crap early in the morning. So what if my shoe's loose at three o'clock?" Well, why don't you bend down and tie it? And you have time to go to the gym and you don't tie it. This is fascinating to me, him with the damn shoe. <laughs> Ask him about the shoe one day. I will. I will. That's great. Speaking of shoes, his new, his new shoes came out. I think you probably saw it. Yeah. yeah, yeah K Swift. Oh, yeah. oh, good. I got another plug to you. You're okay. just setting these things up. You That's and I right. didn't even talk about this. That's right. Um, January 26th is the release of uh, the FUBU Puma collaboration, Puma's 50th year anniversary, mm. uh, FUBU's 25th year anniversary, the first time we've ever done a collaboration. It's, uh, it is it is hip-hop to the T. Nice. Hip-hop from, from 30, 40 years ago when everybody wore Pumas That's to... Right. Fubu and it's a limited time, so and and Gary sold out of his shoes. I really love it. Yeah. Uh, you know, he is just he he his grind is crazy, yeah. and and he's in the book too. And yeah. um, I mean, some of the things he says is just <laughs> he, he he said something, and I don't want to I don't want to take it out of context. But sure. I was like, well, what motivates you? You know, when I said fear, yep. like fear was like, you know, did I um? I can guess what his answer is, but it, I'm gonna let you say it. Yeah, I was like, my fear was like. Man, people are gonna laugh at me because you know I did FUBU one time and I, I got you know I may not be able to do it again. I was like, "What's your fear?" He was like, "My family's dead. I go home and they're dead." <laughs> I was like, uh, "Yeah, it's and, highly paranoid." Yeah, yeah I was like, "Holy crap, <laughs> that's pretty real." Yeah, did you know that one? I did. Yeah, he, I, he has revealed that to me. Usually, it's he's he's dead. But no, it's, he was like it's family family's worse. Dead. Yeah, yeah. He talks I didn't about want it. to get in. I mean, that's not even. Yeah. How do you even like, start saying? Well, so how do they die? You know, <laughs> like, how, do you, how do you get into you? What's the follow-up question? Just, that's just like hot potato, and you just you just walk away from that one. It's like, what's oh, the follow-up question? So trust me, his interview yeah. is crazy. I get it. I get it. Uh, one question on the on the hip hop collaboration there. Yep. So uh, Puma. Like Puma. Puma Suede from the way back? Yeah, yeah. Puma the Suede, the break dancing, fat laces, Puma Suede. Oh, man. Um, you know, they, uh, they're, they're, uh, you know, we're doing that collaboration, and I'm really honored about it because, you know, as a little little brown boy from Queens who couldn't go out on a, on, on, on a, on a Saturday night and I had to listen to the old hip-hop shows like Mr. Magic and just color and dye my Pumas all night long, that was my Friday night, or taking the little skinny laces and getting the iron and making them nice and fat because I couldn't buy the fat ones. Oh, wow. Um, and starching them and making them fat, you know, again. Uh, it, it, it's, it's amazing. It just shows that, you know, if you're really doing something you absolutely love, you know, you'll be, you'll, you know, you'll end up being, you'll end up living the life you want to live if you do it and you're disciplined, though. And that's the purpose of Rise and Grind. Yeah. Discipline creates freedom. Discipline creates freedom. That's it. You have to be disciplined. You have to have a method. You have to act, learn, and repeat. And you have to keep figuring it out, you know. Oh, yeah. um, P this book is not going to this book is not going to give you the answers to life. This book is going to give you a technique to act on it and then next year you may have to switch that technique up and use something else in there. Because people always ask us the same thing. How do you have work life balance, you know? How do you take care of your health? How do you advance your company but yet pay attention to the to the to the customer that really is taking care of you but how are you going to move into this new area of life without ignoring them? How do you get good management underneath you? How do you uh, you know cash flow is always an issue. How do you increase sales or reduce costs? How do you uh, uh, gain new customers in the world? You know, uh, what do you do with your kids? How do you spoil the kids or not spoil the kids? Make, you know, we all have the same exact yeah, problems. Same problem. So what we have to do is look at these techniques and create a bunch of discipline, disciplinary actions 
and you'll see what works and what doesn't, but some things are not gonna work. You can fix it, you gotta fix it, you know? All right, so two, I think, if we stay on Rise and Grind for a moment. So you talked about, a, a, there's a couple of patterns. I wanna talk about those patterns, and I also wanna talk about what, I think we'll save the book for folks to go home and check it out. So, so they can read about all the individual folks we've name dropped, but I wanna know what your morning routine is. What, is the, what are your answers to the questions that you asked of other people? Well, they've changed after the book. Interesting. Um, my, and just small, small adjustments. Mm -hmm. uh, my morning routine has always been to get up and I have uh, 10 goals that I read. Um, and before I get up, what I do is I actually look at the phone and emails, but not to answer them, but that stimulates my brain. Because I'm dyslexic, you use more of your brain to concentrate on something. That's why dyslexic people fall asleep easily after reading one or two pages, but that gets me going. That gets my mind going. Now, I cut it off immediately five minutes in okay. because I don't want to get uh, inundated and or drown in those things, yeah, right? Yeah, those are other people's priorities. Right? Everybody's priorities, right? As uh, as uh, Chris Sacka says, you know, uh, my, my inbox is my uh, defense, my outbox is my offense, right? So I just do that to spark, you know, and, and get me going. Then I go over my 10 goals. The same 10 goals that I read the, you know, the evening before I went to bed because it's the last thing I'll ever think about. The 10 goals are basically very simple. Uh, seven of them expire in uh, six months, and then the other three, one expires in five, one expires in 10, one expires in 20. And I sit there and read those that, I, that expire in six months, and um, they range from health to, uh, to spirituality, to uh, business, to family. And I read those goals, and um, and goal reading is a very uh, it's a very detailed uh, uh, exercise that again I, I learned in Thinking Grow Rich. But then you you can see Brian Tracy and a lot of other people have those books. Then I get up, and I immediately do uh, I, I exercise because I give thanks to all the people that are in my life, and if I can make three calls to the people that I love in my life, or texts or emails to tell them that I love them or I care about them, I do that. Um, of course, I do the normal ritual, brushing teeth and all that other stuff. I try to put a little bit in my system, which could be something healthy, hopefully. If, I'm, if it's a bad night of drinking, then it's not going to be healthy, which is something I always have to correct as well, any yep. of us. Yep. Um, because like Gary said, I, I don't sleep as much as I like, but I try to put in the work. And uh, a new technique that I have uh, been uh, employing due to uh, read all the subjects that I've talked to in Rise and Grind is that because I don't sleep much, uh, not on purpose, I used to like to work out at midnight and walk the treadmill to work out because, first of all, my phone is not ringing like crazy. Yep. Uh, I get the zone out. It's peaceful. The gym is empty, whether it's in my house or any place else or whatever the case is. And it gets me tired, and I want to burn the last meal that I've had, and then it gets me tired enough to go to sleep. And I felt that I was using my time more productive. After you know going through these subjects and seeing how many of them get an adrenaline kick early in the morning, yeah. I started to do, I started to work out early in the morning. And what I realized is it saved me more time. I was more productive during the day. Yeah. And if I looked at the month, I saved more time because I was more productive. Yeah. And I can still go at night and walk on the treadmill if I want to or do what I want to do. Uh, I don't want to replace that great habit with a nasty habit. Yeah. I just double down on a great habit. Yeah. Um, and, and, and so now I'm working out earlier in the day, and, and, and what I'm finding is that even if I'm not working out, it's getting to the gym to physically take that step, go there. You may not even work out that day, but it's the mentality of keeping that ritual going yep. that keeps you going every, every single day. So that's how my, first, my day looks, and then I, then I start hitting the calls and everything else, as I'm, and I try to multitask because I'm you know, moving on to the rest of my day. So anything in particular that you like to do on exercise just again so we can get tactical for a second. I like to I like to just I like to honestly just burn cardio because uh, you know with this new with this new medicine and all this stuff you know obviously I've been gaining a little little bit more weight and then you know the fact that I like golden corral is not helping either but um <laughs> Uh, I like so to just move in the body really is what you're doing it's right moving the body it's, yeah. but the reason why I can do that is I can also I can also uh, I can also email and do things at the time before I know what two hours have passed most yeah. people a lot of people will go on there and they'll look at a TV show and maybe that's their zone out. Sure. I happen to do emails and I, okay. I, I knock them down, you know? And Got then it. I like to do uh, calisthenics. Got it. So that's what your morning looks like. Yeah. Um, can you, this is another thing I like on the show if it's possible. I'll, I, people have been willing to go there. I'm not, just, just a little bit of pressure, but not too much. 
share one of those 10 goals? I know you got some big ones. No is a, no is a fine answer, but hmm? no is a fine no, answer. No, 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 no. So, so one, it, it, one of those 10 goals that you read every day. It, it's easy. Uh, one of the 10 goals is I will... Uh, I will get down to 170. That's my fighting weight, and you know, after like I said, the medicine uh, and and the things have uh, I, I've had to figure right, things yeah. out. But um, I will get down to 173 pounds by uh, uh, is, is April 15th, uh, and I will do this by drinking eight bottles, eight eight glasses of water a day, not eating any fried foods, meats, and not eating after 6 p.m. unless it's after a workout. Uh, I will also put in 10,000 steps a day, and in return for this health, I'll be able to stay around in my daughter's lives and walk them down the aisle. Incredible. So what happens is when I get to a April 15th, I can be 180, doesn't matter. I reset the goal for another six months. But you have to visualize yourself after when you do, because then, then, I, then, I then I say meditate, and what you have to visually look at is me walking my daughters down the aisle. So you powerful. Can't, yeah, you have to visualize it. Because something like losing weight for the sake of losing weight is hard motivation. I think Tony and Robbins like, Tony does a great job with this. Tony Robbins yeah. like, how can you associate something insanely positive with the results of that goal and see yourself in that moment? Yeah. I think that that's powerful. Thank you for sharing that. No problem. All right, now second half of that same question around the book. So in Rise and Grind, you shared with your uh, what your morning is, but what are the patterns? Not all of them, but what are some patterns that you saw? You talked about some sort of uh, quiet meditation, spiritual practice in the morning. You talked about morning exercise. Were there others? Yeah. Uh, offense. When, when do they go on offense? And when do they cut away and take time? And no matter how much, how many fires are around them, everybody takes a certain time to ignore the fires because they'll always be there and go on offense. Uh, that's one of the things that they do. Appreciation for their family. Uh, what are they working for? Whether it's family, uh, loved ones, community, or causes, when are they stepping away to appreciate that because they work so hard? And a lot of these things are super, super simple. Yeah. Um, but as you, as, you, as you look at it, you look at the things they do compounds. Um, you know, the efforts they make compound and, great, and create something much, much bigger. And, uh, um, and there's other techniques that I've noticed. Uh, you know, Barbara Barbara on the show has a technique, and I've seen it uh, highlighted a couple of different ways with, throughout the book. A lot of people write down what they hate, write down what they love, and they start focusing more on what they love and start trying to outsource and or get done with what they hate, and they keep focusing on what they love. And then what that does is it brings them over to that place in life where they want to be because they're acknowledging what they yeah. hate and they're acknowledging what they love. And if they make an effort to outsource this or get this out of it or stop doing or, or stop dealing with these people or stop having these thoughts or yeah. being proactive to get this thing right, they start to they start to lean more towards here in life. Wow. That's it's in a way it's sort of like a visualization, right? And you're you're seeing progress every time you check one of those things off the list. Yeah, you know, I I I, I this is not in the book, but I, I have a I have a dear friend. She is a, a, a um a hairstylist in Vegas and she wrote down a list. She was like I love doing hair because I love the way it makes people feel, but I hate standing in the in this beauty salon because those women in there are just gossiping and there's nothing of value there. I don't want to stand on my feet all day and I don't want I don't want to touch all these dyes that could give me cancer. But I do want to live somewhere by a beach. I want to be my own entrepreneur and I want to make up my own hours. So she started to look at that and she started to realize the weaknesses she had is she hated accounting, legal, and all these things that she may not have known. Yep. She started looking at this list and doing stuff, and as she started to do more of what she loved and less of what she hated, she started to say, hey, if you're an accountant or an attorney, you're a female, uh, you know, I'll come to your house and I'll do your hair, and I'll, be your, I'll come here every month and do your hair every two weeks. You, on the flip side, handle my accounting or legal fees or whatever the case is. So now she got out of the shop. She's making just as much money doing that because they refer her to more friends who come on over. She has a better network here. So now she's gotten out of the shop and she feels good about it because she's changing their lives and making them feel good about themselves. Yeah. And on the flip side, she's gotten a couple of Airbnbs and she Ubers during the day and she's now living, uh, you know, she has a house in California that she goes out and visits every once in a while. She stays on the beach every weekend, comes back to Las Vegas, does what she does. It's took three years, yeah. but it worked because she kept looking at this direction to go to and trying to find a way to get these things out of the way. I also, Folks at home, like you need to pay attention. Like th this is 
who would think that there that, that that's a job that does not exist? I'm a mobile hairstylist for people that provide professional services, and I trade those services so that I can not have to do like. Yeah. If you ever wondered if what you want out there in life is available to you, it's like, there. It is absolutely. You'll figure there. it out. You know, being a being an entrepreneur or a business person could be daunting to a lot of people that thought of it. But the best, the the reason why I think that I hopefully people resonate with my 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 products, my books, and me on Shark Tank is because I like to dumb things down because I'm I just have common sense, right? I like to say it like this: the same way you just said right there that uh, you know she figured it out. That's what a mother does every single day. You know, I always say the mother is an ultimate entrepreneur. She brings this beautiful life into the world. I don't care what books you read; it's not going to be the same for every single child. And she figures it out. Now, dads do too, but, yep. you know, sorry guys. Moms you're not special. actually giving the birth. I'm sorry. Um, and moms figure it out. They don't go and give their child up for adoption when the child has three earaches in a week and you're at the emergency room every night. You know, um, and, and that is what it is. It's simple. It's figuring yeah. it out. It's acting and learning and repeating. Whether it's a child, whether it's in business, it's just figuring it out and never, uh, you know, never getting comfortable with it. There's another... Uh extension of that which I love which is so at what point do you just quit and you know you're just tired of it for example when you're trying to teach your child to walk you're like after 10 tries you're like no nope, she's not a walker ain't gonna happen yeah if she's ain't not a walker happen. we're gonna just call it good <laughs> it just never happens right yeah. like by and large most people in our culture walk and it's because there's this there it's there's this relentless like fall down nine times get up ten over and over and over and there's so many things it was I think it's Cuban actually that says that uh is it like business is like the hardest sport in life or something because it's like 24-7? Yeah. Uh, how does that play in your life? You talked about work-life balance earlier. So do you, do you feel like you have a life or have you made your life like your work in a way that you're joyful around that? Or how do you think about it? I'm constantly trying to figure it out and work on it. Mm -hmm. um, it. It is something that you have to take inventory every six months and see. You know, how you doing? I, I try to get really amazing people around me to take the duties that I that I don't necessarily uh, want to do, I also start to say, well, why am I doing it? You know, a lot of people don't ask themselves why. Yeah. Do I want more cars, more jets, and stuff like that? No, I don't. I, I, speaking of Mr. Cuban, I, uh, I go to Dallas one day, and I'm, you know, I'm like, man, Mark, I've never, I never been to your office, man. Tell me about it. It's the Mavs, all kind of things. You know, it's huge, probably, right? Uh, he, and, cause, and he's like, all right, I'll meet you. And then he comes to the hotel in his pajamas. <laughs> And this is when sidekicks were out looking at a sidekick. And I said, sidekick. why am I going to? I said, I want to go to your office. He said, I haven't been there in three years. I said, like, what do you mean you haven't been in your office in three years? He said, what, am I, what do I want, more money? He said, I want to chill home with my son, the Jakester. I want to answer my things here. I, but I'm like, but well, why do you publicly give out your email if you don't want more work? He's like, I enjoy sitting at home in my pajamas looking at this stuff. And I, you know, and I realized, you know, He's just like me. Why are you doing things? You have to ask yourself, right? And yeah. that is your discipline, right? Why am I going to work every single day? And of course, I understand. A lot of people here don't have the luxury like I, I am afforded now. And you have to go to work. You have to. You have to keep the lights on. And all this kumbaya crap about just do it for love is bullshit. <laughs> At the end of the day, if you got to keep the lights on, right? Sure, there's a practice. Uh, but but, but uh, you got to ask yourself why. And... Um, and, and, I, and I change my habits every six months. I adjust my habits every six months if I can as I take inventory. The beginning of the year is coming up. Yep. Or it's happened or, you know, whenever this is going to air. You know, I know that you may keep it for a very a good time when people really need it. But we started doing this Rise and Grind Challenge a month prior to the top of the year. Yeah. And as you know, you've been supporting it. Yes. And the reason why is that. People in the beginning of the year get out of the gate, the race, and they go, "Oh, I'm gonna wait till the first of the year. I'm gonna start. I'm gonna. I'm gonna start that <laughs> habit then." That's How right. do you start a habit then? It's November 18th, and it, you're like, "Oh, in six weeks." Yeah, I'm you gotta be, start I'm gonna be warming tough. up. You gotta start <laughs> warming up, and you have to take inventory and start making that adjustment so that in the beginning of the year, you've already started to adjust your performance, not start your performance, yeah. and now you're really ready to go. You know. Oh, it's yeah. To a little more context, so uh, when we started, um, when you told me about the new book, and we said, "Well, it would be great to get you back on the show." I think the concept of you 
getting so much done and being such a productive human, I think was infectious. Uh, and the concept of starting this in December, yeah. everyone, everyone in the world is waiting until January 1st. And you know, half of those people by January 13th, they're smoked, they're done, yeah. they've bailed on their goal. And in part, like, like you said, because they, they weren't prepared. But what, what is with the, the new year? Like, why not now? Like what's what's yeah? What? It's like going to the gym and not stretching, man. You know, I'm gonna go to the gym and start pumping 150, right? <laughs> Stretch, you know, get ready, right? Get, you know, get you know, get ready because uh, you know if you're doing that, you're already ahead of the curve. And for right? the folks at home, like uh, go search Damon and Creative Live or Damon plus me and and uh, Rise and Grind. There's a bunch of video nuggets that are just so good, so good. All right, so the book. We're lucky enough to get you ahead of schedule here. Your book is out in like four weeks, something like that, mm -hmm. mid-January. Yeah, mid-January. Uh, so that's clearly a big focus for you. What else is on the mid to near term here? Um, so, of course, Shark Tank is always important to me because, uh, you know, um, I, I have the privilege and the honor of being able to invest in somebody else's dream. And uh, it's it's been going on now 10 years. And <laughs> It's years. 10 years. 10 years we're going on. Season 9, we're about to start shooting season 10. ten if years. anybody would ever told me that, <laughs> uh, if you think about my adult life, I've been on now a major network for 35% of my adult life or 33% of my adult life. I would have never thought that. Um, you know, wow. when I was back in the days watching Happy Days, I never knew that I'd be the new Black Fonzie, you know, on ABC. I just <laughs> didn't think that, right? Thank you. Thank you. Black Appreciate Fonzie. it. Hey. But, um... Uh, that's important to me. You can't write this stuff. You can't. <laughs> <laughs> uh, did you do it with two? Did you do it with two thumbs? I like all the thumbs. Whatever, right. anytime, any, right. whatever you could. So um, that's important to me. Um, I have a new daughter, and my uh, you know my daughter's two years old, and she's making me uh, you know revisit uh, you know life in a certain way and the values of life. And my other two girls are just about twenty, and I have been I've been so fortunate to have. Uh, these people in my life that, uh, you know, I'm working now more and more to be a bigger part of my girls' lives because we've sacrificed so much, you know, coming up in business. And, um, and I don't regret it because, uh, you know, even though I was running the world, running around the world trying to make FUBU better, if I was a sanitation worker, I'd have been working 70 hours a week too because I don't know, I don't know how, to, how to cut it off. I just, I just go hard, right? Yeah. Um, and and um, so that, that's important to me. I have Damon On Demand, as I've shared with you, yep. um, where uh, you know, people who want a little bit more of a, a detailed education and they're running a business, uh, they can uh, you know, get my, uh, my, my interactive curriculum. Um, I got so I opened a new space called Blueprint and Co, which uh, I don't know if I shared with you last year. This is a this is a co-working sh uh, space for fellow sharks, yep. not for startups. This is for uh, people who are established, um, who don't want to take a ten-year lease and they want to be a little more mobile in the world. Yep. So, I don't know. I, yeah, I, I yeah. have a bunch of other stuff. I have some other stuff going on. <laughs> I'm gonna put a pin in that for a second yeah. and, and and shift gears. So we've talked. Um, a lot about. Oh, one thing I have okay. a, a everybody. A th sorry, last one because you can probably <laughs> give it to your uh, give it to your your, your fan base um, sure. or your supporters. Uh, and I saw Gary did something very similar too. We this new thing about scoring our speeches has been been pretty popular, and I think that uh, maybe we can do something together as well. Okay, to, we're not. I'm not trying to be a rapper. No, no. Okay, they scored my <laughs> scored my speeches. None of the words rhyme. <laughs> uh, it's not about me. It's about you. You know, no, I don't mention Cristal, Versace in there, nothing. No Maybach. No, no. Maybach. No Maybach. <laughs> maybe, maybe a. Give me that? more context Bugatti. here. I, you, I'm, I'm woefully missing this one. Yeah, so, uh, so a friend of mine was saying, listen, it was Martin Luther King's birthday, and they were playing his very legendary speech, and then they put a bed of, every year. of music underneath it, and it was really cool. And he was like, can I have some of your speeches? I said, why? He said, well, he said, honestly, I'm a fan of yours, but if I listen to your speech once, just the speech itself, it's cool, right? But I don't need to listen to it again, maybe another time. He said, but if there is a, a, a if there's some rhythmic to it or hook or something like that, he said, I wanna, I wanna listen to that on the treadmill. I wanna listen to that on, in the car or on the way, and I wanna keep listening to it. So Damon, instead of having to do a thousand speeches, let me just play this a thousand times. I was like, well, I'll give you a speech. He's like, let me chop it up, and he did it, and and um, we've been getting good response. We just went and we just give it away to people. So, um, finding a way to be a little more um, hypnotic, I guess. No, <laughs> I, I it? think it's amazing. I was just thinking, you know, part of my morning routine is I always will program uh, like 
five to 15 minutes of some sort of mental programming yeah. of consuming something that I know is valuable. It can be music if I need to get up. Yeah. It can be uh, a talk and so uh, a recording that I've had of myself or someone else. That's brilliant. What's it called again? Uh, I think one of the speeches is called Wave. The other one's called uh, some other one. We're going to give it give okay. it to you just to give it. We're not, Great. it's not yeah, for yeah, sale. Yeah. It's to give to people to okay. hopefully give them a little bit. Just cool, a little we'll put um, that in the show notes. Um, what's your hardest thing right now? What's, what's hard for you? We've talked a lot about all the goodness. Um, what's hard right now? You know, trying to, trying to solve all the world's problems. It's a crazy time right now, isn't it's it? Try, it's, it's hard. You know, Huge we, victory yesterday. Alabama. Yes, Alabama, huge victory. Huge. Shout out to the Democrats. Um, I think black that I, women came yeah, out. Yeah, they came that. out. They came out. Um, being somebody who has the has a public stage, I want to. I want to. Every time I see, you know, uh, a young man die at the hands of the police, or a cop die because you know, blue lives, all lives matter. Mm -hmm. I want to save the world. Every time I see. Every time I see. Um, our our leader talking about um, athletes not kneeling or whatever the case is, but yet we're not addressing that you can still buy a, a, a weapon that can kill 500 people in a short period of time, and you'll never need that type of weapon for target shooting and or hunting. That that weapon is still available to us at any given time, and nobody's talking about that, but they want to talk about... Uh, an athlete kneeling. A, an athlete, yeah, kneeling, or, or somebody getting arrested in China, somebody's brother getting arrested in China. I think that I think that I think that I I need to try to take illegal guns off the street. How do I how do I help uh, stop human trafficking? I am on the Petco uh, board, the foundation, where I want to make sure our furry little friends of ours can uh, who can't fight for themselves they're protected. Um, the new Me Too um, uh, thing that's been going on. I think that the voices that have been silenced in the past need to be heard, and I'm glad that certain people. Who is evident when after you see 50 different cases, I think those you know come out of nowhere. I think they should be prosecuted, and I'm glad that that the victims now have somewhat of a voice. How can I help them? Because I was been part of um, I was part of Joe Biden's um, it's on it's us on campaign. Us. Same, yeah, yeah. yeah. you were part of it, yeah. Oh, so yeah. you are, you obviously know the stats, and and a, and a man who has three daughters and a beautiful ex-wife, a beautiful current wife, and my my mother. I'm surrounded by women, and I'm I'm a great man because of women. I don't. You know, um, I, 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 most men want to act all like this and that. No, I'm a product of amazing, amazing women. How do I protect them? How do I, how do I, how do I let people know about early detection? Pap smears, mammograms, colonoscopies, endoscopies. Because if you get early detection, I've been getting so many letters now about people saying that I helped save their life because they either nudge their brother, aunt, son, yeah. or somebody to go get a something, and they found something and caught it in time because of what happened to me. I'm cancer free. I'm running around here. I'm enjoying myself. I'm hanging out with you. I want people to be like me instead of looking somebody sick on TV, going, "Oh my God, I don't want that to happen to me." I want somebody to say, "No, I want to drink and party like Dave." and John and enjoy life because I got early detection. So all these things are the things that I'm... I'm um, stressing you out. It's stressing me out as well as I'm spreading myself too thin because I always say, man, my little two-minute effort here and then two-minute effort here, maybe I need to... I've got to bring something in and just really make it mine and, and, and change some lives. So I always just... I always say, I always say, am I using my time enough? Because when we look at people that the underappreciated commodity in this country like a teacher or like veterans or people that go across and deal with Ebola and, and go and, and fight things, they make me feel like such a loser. <laughs> you know it's what I crazy, mean? crazy, isn't it? They're dedicating themselves to everybody the front else. Line stuff the frontline so people funny. are amazing. So it makes me feel like, man, you better get up and do more. Yeah, you know? I was married to a teacher. Well, I am married to Kate. She used to be a teacher, and that's yeah. in part was like, oh, God, we got to change. There's some stuff in the schools that's yeah. just like crazy the, the the lack of access to resources and great learners and whatnot again that helped inspire. I don't know how life. teachers do it. I, I I watched my kids for one week. I wanted to jump out the window. Put thirty. They, wa of them. they watch like thirty kids for like <laughs> ten months. I know. That's crazy. That's crazy. Okay, so that's hard for you. That's that's fair. Um, what's something that people don't know about you that would be surprised to know if you shared with them right now? I'm a I'm a big outdoors person. You know, I am. Uh, I, I Last do. Last time we talked, you were going fishing. I think, right? You like fishing? Uh, I, right? I, I fishing. I uh, snowboarding. I shoot a recurve uh, bow. Knife throwing. I've been learning now um, kiteboarding. Um, 
banshees and all that. I mean, I'm a big outdoors person. Uh, let me see. Um, but you're the, an icon of, of like urban culture. Yeah, urban culture, right? And hip hop. Got and a then, hunting line coming out anytime uh, soon? No, no, <laughs> no. But but you know, listen, I like that. Um, I'm a I'm a. I think I'm a joyful person. I think that um, hopefully, I mean, you know, my staff laughs at my jokes, but that's what they're paid to do. Um, but mostly, everybody. Ted didn't else. even look up. Because he, he, I'm not watching him, <laughs> but if I looked at him, he would laugh because that's what I pay them to do. I mean, it's Christmas time coming around, bonuses, right? Right. 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 So, um, but on on the show, I'm portrayed, not portrayed. It's really me. There's no acting, but edited. I, it's edited, right? Sure, right so, so you think about Let's this. A, a pitch is an hour long. Mm -hmm. And every one of us, you only see eight minutes of it. But Mark Burnett and Clay and the, and the producers are brilliant. It really is business theater, no matter what. So what do they do? They pull out the characters you are. We're all characters, mm -hmm. right? Robert is Gormer Pyle. Robert is going, he's the goofy little thing. Cause I you was say that to him? Or yes, do I have to play oh, this oh, you gotta, you gotta okay. hear what I, You gotta hear what I call him. <laughs> but um, I always say, man, I, I smile and laugh all the time. Why, why don't you? Show us this. He, and and uh, you know, my producer goes, no, you're the snake in the grass. You're the quiet one. You're the thinker. Robert can smile. He's going to repile. You can't smile. What's Cuban? Cuban's a cowboy. You don't never want to know when Cuban's going to come out with his six-shooter blazing guns. What's Kevin? Kevin's the devil. <laughs> Kevin the devil. is the devil. Lori, Miss Crabtree, prim and proper, cute, nye, 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 you know. <laughs> so people, people always see me and go, man, uh, you know, you're smiling. I go, what the hell, you thought I didn't have any teeth or something? <laughs> yeah, I'm smiling. So anyway, that's some people don't know that I have somewhat level of a, you know, I smile, you know. Any other behind the scenes, uh, dirt's the wrong word, but uh, I, just, I just know folks at home love access to things they don't always get to see. You know. You guys seem like uh, it's, a, it's a reasonably fun group to be a part it, of. It is amazing dealing with them because if you think about it, we've been now nine and going on 10 years. And it's 10 yeah. years if you look at the, the filming, uh, Length, we have become very close friends. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, well, I'm, well, uh, the, here's a better way to say it. I'm like uh, the meat in a moron sandwich. They all come to me for one reason or another. Barbara and I, we live in New York, you know, we hang out. I love Barbara. Plus, um, I always say that she's the favorite shark that I love because then she lets me stay at her beach house. So <laughs> if I keep saying that, I can stay at her beach house. She's absolutely amazing. Barbara is the fa my favorite shark, uh, Sharkette. Lori and Dan, Lori's really, really great woman. Um, you know, behind the scenes, um, I say I say stupid dad jokes to Lori and I get her off of her game. When she's trying to do a really like serious, uh, you know, like, hey, so, you know, I'm gonna offer you uh, $100,000 for this and I'm trying to get to her. I go, Psst, Lori. She goes, what? I go, what did the grape say when it got stepped on? She's like, what? I say, nothing, it just let out a little wine. And she will crack up for the next <laughs> half an hour, and I'll go snatch a deal from her. Right. Um, Kevin O'Leary, he's the sweetest guy, you know, all the set. Devil? Yeah, he, he, he just, that's the way he thinks about money, right? Yeah. I take him to the most ghettoest clubs in the country. I take him to the bowels of the <laughs> underground. I take him to live on Sunday night in Miami. And you have to see him walking through. He looks like there's this one little white man walking through with a shiny head in this huge club and all the black people are like, yo, Mr. Wonderful, Mr. Wonderful. <laughs> and he's walking through like, you're dead to me? You're dead to me. <laughs> uh, we just have a good time. Cuban is a, Cuban is a beers and chips kind of guy. He yeah. is a, He's an amazing guy. I remember taking him uptown Harlem one day. I was like, hey, man, I'm going to take him to the Rucka Park up there. You know, you got to see this lot of a lot of homies up there, be careful. We get up there, they were like, yo, Cube, you left your wallet at the bar last week. You know? <laughs> They're just amazing people. And um, Robert and, and, our, and our daughters, Robert's kids and, and my kids, they, they, they go away for summers at a time with each other. So. Cool. I think, I mean, I know, I know Mark reasonably, uh, Sir Richard, Chris Saka. Yeah, Chris. Chris. But, uh, and I, I think it's a, the, when I think about, from a pop culture standpoint, what the producers have done, assemble a really interesting cross-section of people. They, 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 uh, it's absolutely amazing. I never thought the show would, would pass one or two years, because I was like, who the hell wants to see people just talking like we're business talking. crap, like we're, we all do in boardrooms every yeah. day, and leave it up to them, they, they know what they're doing. Uh, 
I appreciate your time, man. It's been super good having you on the oh, show. Thank you. So don't forget about the old book because the old book is very powerful. Power broke. Power broke, yes. But uh, congrats on the new one, Rise and Grind. Check out the little video series we've been doing with Damon. That's been pretty cool. A lot of little video messages. But Rise and Grind drops on the 20. Ted, help us with this. 20? 20, 23. 23. 23. 23 July. Doesn't matter January when you January 23rd. Um, but don't wait to get started on your goals. Don't wait to start getting a goal January 23rd for Rise and Grind. And uh, thank you for having me, man. I appreciate it. Always a pleasure, David. Thank you. Bye. See you again tomorrow.